محمد و آل محمد صلوات اللهم صلی على محمد و آل محمد بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم يا علي يا عليم يا غفور يا رحيم أنت رب العليم الذي ليس كمثله شيء وهو السميع البصير وهذا شحر عزمته وكرمته وشرفته وفضلته على الشهور وهو الشحر الذي فرزت ثيامه عليه وهو الشهر رمضان الذي أنزلت فيه القرآن هدى للناس وبينات من الهدى والفرقان وجعلت فيه ليلة القدر وجعلتها خيرا من, من ألف شهر فيا ذا المني ولا يمن علي من علي بفكاك رقبتي من النار في من تمن علي وأدخل الجنة برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين <تصفيق> اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم رب شهر رمضان الذي أنزلت فيه القرآن وافترزت على إبادك فيه السيام صلي على محمد وآل محمد وارزقني هج بيتك الهرم في آمي هذا وفي كل عام وخفر لي تلك الذنوب العذام فإنه لا يغفرها خيرك يا رحمن يا علام اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم إني أفتتح السناء بهمدك وأنت مسدد للثواب بمنك وأيقنت أنك أنت أرحم الراحمين في موضع العف والرحمة وأشد المعاقبين في موضع النقال والنقمة وعدم المتجبرين في موضع الكبرياء والعظمة اللهم أذنت لي في دعائك ومسألتك فاسمع يا سميع مدحتي وأجب يا رهيم دعوتي وأقل يا خفو أسرتي فكم يا إلهي من قربة قد فرجتها وهم من قد كشفتها وأسرة قد أقلتها ورحمة قد نشرتها وحلقتي بلاء قد فككتها الحمد لله الذي لم يتخذ صاحبة ولا ولدا ولم يكن له شريك في الملك ولم يكن له ولي من 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 الذل وكبره تكبيرا الحمد لله بجميع مهامده كلها على جميع نعمه كلها الحمد لله الذي لا مضاد له في ملكه ولا منازع له في أمره الحمد لله الذي لا شريك له في خلقه ولا شبيه له في عظمته الحمد لله الفاشف الخلق أمره وحمده الله بالكرم مجدوه الباستي بالجود يده الذي لا تنقص خضائه 
خائنه ولا تزيده كسرة العطاء إلا جودا وكرما إنه هو العزيز المهام اللهم إني أسألك قليلا من كثير ما حاجة بي إليه عظيمة وخناك عنه قديم وهو عندي كثير وهو عليك سهل يسير اللهم إن أفك عن ذمي وتجاوزك عن خطيئتي وسفحك عن ظلمي وسترك على قبيه عملي وحلمك عن كثير جرمي عندما كان من خطئي وعمدي أتمعني في أن أسألك ما لا أستوجبه منك الذي رزقتني من رحمتك وأريتني من قدرتك وأرفتني من إجابتك فسرت أدؤك آمنا وأسألك مستأنسا لا خائفا ولا وجلا مدلا عليك فيما قصدت فيه إليك فإن أبت عني أتبت بجحلي عليك ولأن الذي أبت عني هو خير لي لإلك بعاقبة الأمور فلم أرى مولا كريما أسبر على أبد لئيم منك علي يا ربي إنك تدعوني فأوليئك وتتحبب إلي فأتبخد إليك وتتودد إلي فلا أقبل منك كأن لي تطول عليك فلم يمنع كذلك من رحمتي لي والإحسان إلي والتفضل علي بجودك وكرمك فارحم أبدك الجاهل وجد عليه بفضل إحسانك إنك جواد كريم الحمد لله مالك الملك مجر الفلك مسخر فالق الإسباح ديان الدين رب العالمين الحمد لله على حلمه بعد علمه والحمد لله على أفره بعد قدرته والحمد لله على طول أناته في خضمه وهو قادر على ما يريد الحمد لله خالق الخلق باسط الرزق فالق الإسباح ذي الجلال والإكرام والفضل والإنعام الذي بعد فلا يرى وقروب فشهد النجوى تبارك وتعالى الحمد لله الذي ليس له منزع يعادله ولا شبيه يشكله ولا ذحي يعادده قهر بعزته العزاء وتوادع لعظمته العظماء فبلغ بقدرته ما يشاء الحمد لله الذي يجيبني حين أنادي ويستر علي كل عورة وأنا عاسي ويعظم النعمة علي فلا أجازي فكم من موهبة حنيئة قد عطاني وأذيمة مخوفة قد كفاني وبحجة مونقة قد عوني فأثني عليه حامدا وأذكره مسبحا الحمد لله الذي لا يهتك هجابه ولا يخلق بابه ولا يرد سائله ولا يخيب عامله الحمد لله الذي يؤمن الخائفين وينجي الصالحين ويرفع المستذعفين ويدعو المستكبرين ويحلق ملوك 
لكم ويستخلف آخرين والحمد لله قاسم الجبارين مبين الظالمين مدرك الحارمين نكال الظالمين تريخ المستسرخين مودعي حاجات الطالبين معتمد المؤمنين الحمد لله الذي من خشيته ترعد السماء وسكانها وترجف الأرض وأمارها وتموج البحار ومن يسبه في غمراتها الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله الحمد لله الذي يخلق ولم يخلق ويرزق ولا يرزق ويطعم ولا يطعم ويميت الأحياء ويحيي الموتى وهو هي لا يموت بيده الخير وهو على كل شيء قدير اللهم سلي على محمد أبدك ورسولك وامينك وسفيك وحبيبك وخيرتك من خلقك وحافظ سرك ومبلغ رسالتك أفضل وأحسن وأجمل وأكمل وأزكى وأما وأتيب وأتهر وأسنى وأكثر ما سليت وباركت وترحمت وتهننت وسلمت على عهد من عبادك وأنبيائك ورسلك وسفوتك وأهل الكرامة عليك من خلقك اللهم وسلي على علي نامير المؤمنين ووسي رسول رب العالمين أبدك ووليك وأخي رسولك وخجتك على خلقك وآيتك القبر والنبي العظيم وسلي على صديقة الطاهرة فاتمة الزهراء سيدة نساء العالمين وسلي على سبت الرحمة وإمام الهدى الحسن والحسين سيد شباب أهل الجنة وسلي على أئمة المسلمين علي بن الحسين ومحمد بن علي وجعفر بن محمد وموسى بن جعفر وعلي بن موسى ومحمد بن علي وعلي بن محمد والحسن بن علي والخلف الهادي المهدي حججك على إبادك وأمنائك في بلادك سلاة كثيرة دائمة اللهم وسلي على ولي أمرك القائم المؤمل والأدل المنتظر وخفه بملائكتك المقربين وأيده بروح القدس يا رب العالمين اللهم اجعله الداعي إلى كتابك والقائم بدينك استخلفه في الأرض كما استخلفت الذين من قبله ما كان له دينه الذي ارتديته له أبدله من بعد خوفه أمنا يعبدك لا يشرك بك شيئا اللهم أعزه وأعزز به وانصره وانتسر به وانصره نسرا عزيزا وافتح له فتح يسير واجعل له من لدنك سلطانا نسيرا اللهم أذهر به دينك وسنة نبيك حتى لا يستخفي بشيء من الحق مخافة أحد من الخلق اللهم إنا نرغب إليك في دولة كريمة 
تعز بها الإسلام وأهلا وتذل بها النفاق وأهلا وتجعلنا فيها من الدعاة إلى طاعتك والقادة إلى سبيلك وترزقنا بها كرامة الدنيا والآخرة اللهم ما أوفتنا من الحق فهملنا وما قصرنا عنه فبلغنا اللهم المن به شعثنا وشعب به سدعنا وارتق به فتقنا وكسر به قلتنا وعزز به ذلتنا وأخن به عائلنا وقد به أم مخرمنا وجبور به فقرنا وصد به خلتنا ويسر به غصرنا وبيذ به وجوهنا وفك به أسرنا وانجح به تلبتنا وانجز به مواعيدنا واستجب به دعوتنا وعأتنا به صلنا وبلغنا به من الدنيا والآخرة آمالنا وعتنا به فوق رغبتنا يا خير المسؤولين ووسع المؤتين اشف به صدورنا وأذهب به خيد قلوبنا واحتنا به لما اختلف فيه من الحق بإذنك إنك تهدي من تشاء إلى سرات مستقيم وانصرنا به على عدوك وعدونا إلى الحق آمين اللهم إنا نشكو إليك فقد نبينا سلواتك عليه وآله وخيبة ولينا وكسوة عدونا وقلة عددنا وشدة الفتن بنا وتذاخر الزمان علينا فسلي على محمد واله وعنا على ذلك بفطهم منك تعجله وبذر تكشفه ونسر طئزه وسلطان حق تظهره ورحمة منك تجل تجللناها وعافية منك تلبسناها برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم برحمتك في الصالحين فادخلنا وفي إليين فارفعنا وبكأس من معين من عين سل سبيل فاسقنا ومن الهور العين برحمتك فزوجنا ومن الولدان المخلدين كأنهم لؤلؤ مكنون ف فأخدمنا ومن سماع الجنة ولهوم الطير فأتعمنا ومن سيام بالصندوس والحرير والإستبرى قيف ألبسنا وليلة القدر وحج بيتك الحرام وقتلا في سبيلك فوفق لنا وسالح الدعاء والمسألة فاستجب لنا وإذا جمعت الأولين والآخرين يوم القيامة فرحمنا وبراءة من النار فاكتب لنا وفي جهنم فلا تخل لنا وفي عذابك وهوانك فلا تبتلنا ومن الزقوم والضريع فلا تطعمنا ومع الشياتين فلا تجعلنا وفي النار على وجوهنا فلا تكبرنا 
ومن ثياب النار وسراب للقة سراني فلا تلبسنا ومن كل سوء يا لا إله إلا أنت بحقنا إله إلا أنت فنجنا اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم إني أسألك أن تجعل فيما تقني وتقدر من الأمر المهتوم فالأمر الحكيم من القضاء الذي لا يرد ولا يبدل أن تكتبني من حجاج بيتك الحرام المبور هجهم المشكور سعيهم المخفور ذنوبهم المكفر عن سيئاتهم وأن تجعل فيما تقضي وتقدر أن تطيل عمري في خير وعافية وتوسي في رزقي وتجعلني ممن تنتسر به لدينك ولا تستبدل بخيري أعوذ بجلال وجهك الكريم أي قضي عني شهر رمضان أو يتل على فجر من ليلتي هذه ولق قبلي تبعة أو ذنب تعذبني عليه اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم أدخل على أهل القبور السرور اللهم أخني كل فقير اللهم أشبه كل جائع اللهم اكس كل أريان اللهم اقضي دين كل مدين اللهم فرج عن كل مكروب اللهم رد كل غريب اللهم فك كل أسير اللهم أسلح كل فاسد من أمور المسلمين اللهم اشفي كل مريض اللهم صد فقرنا بخناك اللهم خير سوء أهالنا بخسن هالك اللهم اقضي عنا الدين وأغننا من الفاق إنك على كل شيء قدير الفاتحة Today's dua recital was young Rehan Ali Devji. Can we have a loud salawat, please? Yeah. Now, can we please welcome a speech by Green Team with salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. A green team is wearing a blue outfit. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Indeed, <coughs> it's my great pleasure to be representing the green team, Hujjat green team, and uh, speaking to you, really presenting a kind of a progress report on our green team uh, activities and our ideas for the future. So, I would like to start off with the first question. What does it mean to be green? It doesn't mean I should wear green things necessarily, but it means a lot of things. So what does it really mean? So it means to be, seriously speaking, to be the servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To manifest your, your ubudiyya, your servitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, 
to be mindful of the Quranic injunctions on many of the theological embedded uh, beliefs that we have, which are already in the Holy Quran, which is like amana, there is uh, mizan, asraf, wastage, pollution, spoiling the planet, and it also means developing a green mindset. So you see, a green mindset is not simply bringing your cup and you know your plate and cup here once or in the month of Ramadan. You have to be green throughout the year, and you have to develop a green mindset to think green even at your home. You need to see how you are doing in terms of ecology and the features which you should be representing. I should like to also s highlight that in this very beautiful re refurbished center that we have, if you have thought about this, what are the various green features in this refurbishment? Have you thought about it? We have new roof, which is bringing insulation, new double glazed windows which are being uh, installed, we have an installation of a system which is called HVAC system, which is zoned so that what actually happens is some parts of the building can be made cold or hot, and it, can be, it doesn't have to be the whole building. And they, therefore, there is temperature control. And there are also electrical savings, LED lighting, water saving. You're going to wash your hands in the, in the, in the sink, and you see it's automatic sink tape stoppers. So all these are very important, very, very key green features which are already here. And we would like to congratulate our executive committee of Jamaat, the green furbishment, uh, the refurbishment team uh, for having done such a valuable job. Salawat. So now, um, we now, you'd have noticed also that we are now using biodegradable which is not plastic, not styrofoam. But um, this is the question that I'm asking here. It's a very good thing in the temporary, as a temporary measure, to be using this uh, biodegradable material. Since uh, it is also disposed, it also goes to the landfill. And if the local authority doesn't compost it, it will have to remain there and biodegrade in the normal way. So now, uh, which, is this really the best solution in the long term? So what is our solution for the long term? The solution for the long term is the installation of a large industrial dishwasher in our center, which will do washing, food separation, and also drying cycles incorporated in the whole dishwasher. We, will have, we have space for it, and uh, the refurbishment uh, uh, team have in, assured me that they are going down in the kitchen area and we should be able to have space for a, a very large I industrial dishwasher. We have done feasibility study. We have worked it out. The green team has worked it out. It will pay for itself in a very short period of time, relatively speaking. This is being considered in consultation with the refurbishment team and most importantly, the kitchen volunteers. Because this is going to save the kitchen volunteers valuable time in washing and in you know, the utensils and the foodware, and this will enable us to use, you know, disposable, you know, we'll, use, we'll be moving away from the disposable and we'll be using stainless steel or porcelain cutlery. So alhamdulillah, this would be a very, very good step forward. It's long-term, it is sustainable, we'll get rid of biodegradable as well, although we'll need to use it in the, near, in the immediate future, but this is our long-term future. And inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala willing, we are we praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that this can be made possible. Salawat. But in the meantime, we are telling you to bring your own. We are telling each and every person, bring your own cutlery. Why? There is biodegradable. There, the, the reason, the main reason is this is one way in which we can start thinking in terms of being truly green. Bring your own, take it away home, wash it at home. And also, very importantly, if you want to donate towards the refurbishment, you don't have to put your hand in the pocket and take out money to donate. You can actually bring your cup and your plate for 14 iftar events. 
all of you, bring it for 14 iftar events, and you will contribute 4,095 pounds to the refurbishment scheme by simply bringing your own cups, plates, and utensils. You can see this is a huge, huge way of becoming green. So alhamdulillah, we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we all get tawfiq to be able to do that and that we can help the refurbishment team to work on various areas. And lastly, I would like to indicate that there is a big program that we have in terms of how to sensitize uh, our community in green matters. I was so happy. Yesterday, there was a youth who is doing his air levels. He came and talked to me. He sat with me and he asked me, he said, uncle, how do I become green at home? You've been talking about green in the mosque, but how to be green at home? What can I do to become green? So, alhamdulillah, there's a very great, great need for sensitization. We'll have seminars, inshallah, as to how to be green, how to become, uh, de develop the green practices at home as well. We will take you to Cambridge Green Mosque, inshallah. We'll take you there, will show you what a Cambridge Green Mosque has achieved in becoming eco-friendly. So it's possible to be eco-friendly as a mosque. And inshallah, we'll visit there. We are looking forward to, uh, towards cutting the carbon imprint of this uh, mosque to z near zero. And remember, and remember fastly that the youths are so interested in green matters. I was watching the, the podcast and I was amazed at the quality of the discussion that was taking place last night. So inshallah, we want to work with Al Hadi team to be, to be kind of working on youths on various green issues as well. So inshallah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the tawfiq to do more. And I end with asking you to recite salawat. Uh, thank you very much, Makumba. Thank you very much indeed. Muhammad wa ala Muhammad salawat. Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim Friday, 22nd of March, eve of 12th of Maher Ramadan, 1445. Kindly keep your mobile phones on silent during the program. Always keep your belongings with you at all times. Tomorrow, Saturday, 23rd of March, Zohran program will start at 12 p.m. with missiles by Maulana Kalbi Abba Saheb followed by Jamaat Salah at 12.13 p.m. Main evening program will start at 5.45 p.m. in Darsa, tomorrow 5.45 p.m. in Darsa, Salatul Maghribain, Iftar, followed by Duas, lecture, and lecture by Dr. Ehsan Rangiya. Full details of Mahem Ramadan program is on our website. Small business showcase is running for the third time. The third time is on this Saturday, that is tomorrow, 23rd of March. For further details, please visit the Hujat website. The launch of Hujat Health and Welfare Hub will take place this Sunday, 24th of March, from 2.30 p.m. to 5.30 p.m. at Hujat Marquee. This is open to all ladies and gents. Darul Quran Walitra is pleased to announce Quran recitation classes for five and seven years old girls and boys and eight ten years old girls starting from Tuesday 16th of April from 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. at Hujat Stanmore to register please go to Hujat website and fill the form these classes are for new students only the burial fund annual report for 2023 is now available to view on the Hujat website CPV announcement, if parking inside the center, kindly leave your car keys in the car at all times, even if, you are if your car is not blocking any cars. And kindly park your cars starting from the rear of the car park and not in the front row. Our green team message, cut waste, cut costs, bring your plate, cup, cutlery, and save the planet and gain the sawab this Mahi Ramadan. Should you wish to contribute to Sufra Food Donation Bank, kindly utilize the two yellow bins near the uh, gents' entrance. A comprehensive list of acceptable items is on the bins for your reference. Raffle tickets are selling very fast. They are on sale today and with some excellent prices. 
please, please see the treasurer's desk for more details. Mahe Ramadan Tabaruk and Iftar Fund is open. Please donate via online at the Jamaat desk. Via online or at the Jamaat desk. Kindly donate generously at Hujat's, at, for Hujat Stenmo refurbishment at Treasury Desk or online at all the w's.hujat.org. Can we please now welcome Matham Hassan Ali for his five minutes talk? Muhammad Wale Muhammad Salawat. Respected uh, scholars, elders, brothers, and sisters, Asalaamu Alaikum. Today I stand before you to delve deeper into a phenomenon that has permeated our society in recent years. Vaping, the allure of vaping, with its sleek devices and array of enticing flavors, has captured the attention of millions, particularly among, dem among demographics. Behind the billowing clouds of vapor lies a complex landscape fraught with promise and peril. Let us embark on a journey together to, un to uncover the truths and myths surrounding vaping. Vaping in its simplest form involves the inhalation and exhalation of vapor produced by an, an electronic cigarette or similar devices. Unlike traditional cigarettes, which rely on combustion to release tobacco smoke, vaping devices operate by heating a solid solution containing nicotine, flavor, fla flavorings, and other chemicals, transforming it into an aerosol for inhalation. On the surface, vaping may appear as a harmless recreational activity, even acknowledged by some as a safer alternative to smoking. However, this, the reality is far more subtle and requires a closer examination. One of the foremost concerns surrounding vaping is its impact on health. While it is true that vaping eliminates many of the harm, harmful chemicals found in tobacco smoke, it, it is by no means risk-free. Nicotine, the primary addictive component in tobacco, it also presents also present in most vaping liquids, posing significant health risks, particularly for adolescents whose developing brains are more su su susceptible to its effects. Moreover, vaping products may contain other potential harmful substances such as heavy metals and volatile organic compounds, which can pose additional health risks when inhaled. In recent years, we have witnessed a concerning uptick in vaping-related illnesses and fatalities. Particularly among young people, cases of severe lung injuries have been reported, promoting widespread alarm and calls for, re for greater regulation and oversight of the vaping industry. Another trouble aspect of vaping is its allure to youth. With, with, a, with a plethora of appealing flavors and designs, vaping products are often marketed in ways that resonate with y younger people. This has led to a disturbing increase in among teenagers and even preteens, raising serious concerns about addiction and long-term health consequences. So, where do we get from here? First and foremost, education and awareness must be prioritized. It is essential that individuals, especially young people, understand the risks associated with vaping and make, and make informed decisions about their health. Parents, educators and healthcare professionals all have a vital role to play in initiating conversations about vaping and providing, providing support to those struggling with nicotine addiction. Furthermore, there is an urgent need for comprehensive regulation of vaping products. Measures should be implemented to restrict those targeted youth by enacting meaningful regulations. We can, we can mitigate the public health risks associated with vaping, so safeguard and well-being for our communities. In conclusion, vaping is a complex and multi-faced issue with far-reaching implications to public health and well-being. Behind the allure of vaping lie real health, risks and real health risks and consequences, particularly for our youth. By raising awareness, implementing regulations and support cessation efforts, we can address the vaping epidemic and pave the way for a healthier future for all. Thank you for your attention. Let us continue to navigate the clouds of misconception surrounding, surrounding vaping and work together towards a brighter, healthier tomorrow. Thank you. Salawat. Thank you, Mesem. Now, can we please welcome our lecturer, Dr. Hassan, 
with salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad and can I please request you all to move forward, Sant. Doctor. Can we please all move forward, Sant. Audhu billahi minash shaitan ar-rajim Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-anbiya'i wal mursaleen Habib qulubana wa shafi'i dhunubana wa tabib nufusana abil qasim al-Mustafa Muhammad Wa ala ahl bayti al-tayyibin al-tahirin Respected brothers and sisters Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Alhamdulillah, it's an honor and tawfiq to be able to gather in this blessed center and continue the discussion that we started last night surrounding the topic and the qualities of Ibad rahman We spoke about the meaning of Abd, the difference between Abd and Abd. And in summary, for those who were not present last night, we mentioned that there is a big difference between an individual who has achieved and reached the maqam and station of becoming an abd and the one who is an abid. We spoke about the meaning of ibadah, the meaning of worship. What does it mean? It's not only sitting on the sajjada and praying. It is not only when you and I have the tawfiq to go to hajj or umrah. These are different instances and examples of worship. However, the reason that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us for that he mentions in the Holy Quran, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ It is far greater than that. Therefore, we said that Abid is the one who has his own life, has his own identity, and in addition to what he has, in addition to what he does on a daily basis, he also worships God. But Abd is the individual who derives his identity from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The identity of a servant is derived from his master. Like that individual in Ashura that about his name when he was asked, what did he say? He said, Amiri Hussainun wa Ni'mal Amir. That do not worry about whom, what my name is. The point is that my master, my leader is Sayyid al-Shuhada. So a true servant is identified, is distinguished by what his master wants by who the master is. So this, in brief, we said that it is the meaning of Abd. Ubudiya has been fully established in this individual and they have reached the maqam and station of Ubudiya. And then we gave some examples as well that how is it, and the reason we're discussing this topic is that how do we perceive and include God in everything that we do? Beyond the mosque, beyond our prayer mat, beyond our ziyara. Right? How is it that we are able to see this creation, to live our lives, get on with our daily activities, but through our daily activities, we are growing in our spirituality. We are growing in our morality. We are growing as far as our closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is concerned. And the relation between being close to God and perfection is what? is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the absolute perfect. He possesses all characteristics of perfection. Any characteristic, any name of perfection you can think of, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has it, and he has it in the perfect, absolute manner. Therefore, for the individual, for a human being, to want to benefit from qualities of perfection more and more, 
They need to seek closeness to God more and more. Because when we speak about taqarrub ilallah, or we say we pray qurbatan ilallah, that we pray in order to seek closeness to God. Closeness to God is not a physical closeness. It's not a family closeness. It's not a closeness that, okay, well, now I'm in this mosque, I'm closer because of certain physical parameters around me. No. Closeness to God is not physical, is not family. Closeness to God it means that I have been able to benefit and reflect those qualities of perfection more and more. The more I'm able to reflect these qualities, the closer I am to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Ubudiyah is summarized in that. Ubudiyah is that individual, Abd is that individual that more and more he is manifesting these divine characteristics of God. So this was a summary of last night. Now, Abadur Rahman. Abadur Rahman. And these are the qualities of Abadur Rahman that few of them will be mentioning. Abadur Rahman, this individual is an Abd of whom? Of Ar Rahman. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as we mentioned, has so many different characteristics. Any name of perfection goes back to God. But out of all of these names, out of all of these amazing qualities of God, the quality of Rahmah and Rahman has been chosen. Right? Abadur Rahman. These individuals, they are the servants of the most merciful. Rahman has been mentioned in the Holy Quran around 170 times. Rahim has been mentioned around 227 times. So the usage of the words Rahman and Rahim and Rahma, you can find this couple of hundred times has been mentioned in the Quran. And we have in our tradition that, oh Allah, you are the individual that your mercy supersedes, takes precedence over all of your other characteristics. Ya man sabaqat rahmatuhu qadabah. Oh Allah, you are the one that your love, your mercy, your compassion, your care is primary. The primary quality of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is his mercy. You have that all of the verses, all of the chapters in the Quran apart from chapter number 9 starts with Rahman and Rahim. We have that Ar-Rahman Allama al-Qur'an. Ar-Rahman khalaq al-insan. It is Ar-Rahman, is the most merciful who has created the whole creation. It is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the most merciful who has taught human being how to think, how to speak. It is all out of his mercy. In other words, you can say that the creation of God is based on his mercy. The nurturing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the rububiyah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is based on his mercy. And this is not just some theoretical, conceptual discussion to be had. No, this reflects on a practical level as well. That then when we say Ibadur Rahman, the first quality of this Ibadur Rahman is what? Is the rahmah that they have. Is the mercy that they have. When it comes to as the word, when it comes to marriage, we say, وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةً Rahma Rahma again, is the primary principle there. In the creation is the same. In the interaction of the Holy Prophet with everyone around him, again, Rahma is the one that is outstanding. Not only mercy towards human beings, mercy towards, this beyond my discussion, but Rahma when it comes to animals, Rahma when it comes to the environment, Came, I came across a tradition that about, um, about the environment and trees, for example. We have a tradition that the Ma'asum says, لا تقتعوا شجرا إلا أن تذتروا إليها Do not just go around cutting trees, except and unless you are forced, unless there is a pressing reason, there is a clear justification. When it comes to trees, when it comes to animals, we have that divine mercy being cascaded down through the Holy Prophet, through the awliya, and through those individuals who have reached the maqam of ubudiyah. We have in some traditions that when it comes to your animals, when you come across an animal, offer some water to this animal that you have. 
يَبْدَأْ بَعَلَفَهَا إِذَا نَزَلْ We have in our traditions that the Ma'asumin and the Holy Prophet, when they would return back from a travel that they had gone on, they would start with feeding their pets that they had at home. يَبْدَأْ بَعَلَفَهَا إِذَا نَزَلْ When they come back. In other traditions we have that our recommendation is that when you are, because they used to utilize camels and donkeys for, you, for moving things around, they will say, let it not be the case. This ride that you have, do not overburden, do not overload your rides. You know, sometimes we do that with our car when we are moving house. You put so much in it that all your suspension is going down. Or if you're buying like compost or some cement from a DIY shop, you're overburdening the car. We have traditions, we have commandments that when you're utilizing your ride... Do not overburden it. Do not treat the animal that you have with harshness and roughness. Look at the beauty. Look at the subtleties. Without exaggeration, we can spend 30 nights just speaking about rahmah, about the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, these are Ibadur Rahman. Therefore, when it comes to you and I, individuals who hopefully we have embarked or we are starting to embark on this journey of Ubudiyah, the first and foremost area that we need to look at in our lives is how merciful and how kind am I? Starting from my own household, the way I am with my children, the way I am with my parents, the way I am with my neighbors, the way I am with the individuals who wrong me, because the individual who does good to me and is kind to me, if I'm kind back, I'm not really doing much. I'm just repaying, I'm just reciprocating what they have done. But the art is that the individual who treats you badly, the individual who disrespects you, you are the one who exemplify and embody this mercy. And this is how the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was when he came in the interaction with different individuals. Some of the enemies of the Prophet, they would take mud, the children, they would take mud, make them into like a ball, and they would put thorns and spikes in it, and they would throw it to the Holy Prophet. The Prophet would go and collect these. This is mentioned in, in, our, in our history. He would go and collect these and come and give it back to these kids. And they would say, he would say, I do not want you to go through the trouble of taking these thorns again. Look at the mercy. Look at the beauty. The beauty of Sayyidah Shahada that we mentioned last night on the day of Ashura, individuals who blocked water upon him and his family, individuals who scared his children, individuals who stood in front of the best of the creation of God. How many times we have in our maqatil that the imam would pray for them? Oh Allah, have mercy on them. Oh Allah, forgive them. They are individuals who do not know, they do not recognize. How many sermons the Holy Messenger, the Holy Imam gave prior to the day of Ashura? A few years ago, the discussion we had 10 nights was on the sermons of Sayyid al-Shuhada preceding to the day of Ashura. Unfortunately, we don't speak about it much. But so many different sermons and the main motive behind all of that is what? Is the mercy of the Imam. Is the love of the Imam. That he doesn't want individuals to fall into this trap that you are coming to take away the life of the grandson of the Messenger of God. No, I care for you. This is mercy. Mercy exemplified in a human being is when that individual at the name of Hur, when he blocks the path of Sayyid al-Shuhada, the first person, one of the bravest men of Kufa, when he comes back in that state, you have all heard the stories. But these are not stories for you and I just to cry. These are stories for you and I to be awakened. These are stories that gives life. You know, normally you, put, you give stories to children to put them to sleep. But the stories of the Quran, the stories of the Ahlul Bayt, the stories of the encountering of the Ahlul Bayt with other human beings and other creation of God, they are stories that wake us up. They don't put us to sleep. When that individual comes, says, Halli man tawbah. Do you find any return for me? Do you find any repentance for me? Now, oh, if it was me, what would I say? It says, Raise your head, O oh, Hur. 
You are free. You are hur like the way that your mother has named you free. You are hur and free in this world and you are free in the hereafter. A few minutes ago, he's the one who puts fear in the heart of your children. But you when you become the manifestation of Ibadur Rahman, this is what it becomes. When the Holy Prophet again, out of all of his divine characteristics that he has, the Quran addresses him, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ You are a mercy, not only to the creation of God, not only to mankind. لِلْعَالَمِينَ Some of us say everything that exists Alameen is through whatever the knowledge of God is attained, is achieved. Ma yu'lamu bih. Anything which takes you to God is alameen. It's not just other human beings. It's everything that exists in the creation. Now, this is an area for us to ponder and reflect. That am I, if I was to judge myself, the way I'm interacting with the people around me, have I taken any fragrance of this rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of the Ahlul Bayt, of the Awliya of Allah or not? So, Ibadur Rahman. Now, this was supposed to be the introduction until we start going through the verses. Wa Ibadur Rahman, we said this is mentioned in Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, from verses number 60. Three, two, seventy-seven. Ahsantum. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. The Quran continues and he says that amongst the main characteristics of these Abad al-Rahman is what? Yamshoon ala al-Ard hawna. These individuals one of the first qualities they have, of course, after Rahmah, is that the way, the literal translation, الَّذِينَ yamshuna, those who walk on earth in the state of Haun. Of course, this walking is not the, only the physical walking. Mash is your lifestyle, in the way that you are, in the way that you walk in this creation in the way that you interact with the creation, right? So part of it is the physical walking, and part of it is the way that we interact, our lifestyle. These individuals are those who have a lifestyle which is hauna. Hauna is what? Haun is, is humble, is softness. Adab al hun we have in the Quran, right? Is when the criminals are humbled before the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it comes from humility. So in other words, amongst the first characteristics of these Abadur Rahman is the humility that they have in this world. Now, before we open up this topic of humility, there is a subtlety that I would like to mention here. That maybe if you read an English translation of the Quran, you will not get that. The verse says, الَّذِينَ يَمْشُونَ عَلَى الْأَرْضِ حَوْنَا Here there is a very, very subtle point. And that is the following. Those who walk on earth, right? عَلَى الْأَرْضِ You know, we say that الْكِتَابُ عَلَى الطَّاوَلَة This book is what? Is on this table. Or we say, Al-ma'u fil Water is in this cup. Please pay careful attention. I want to open it up so it doesn't become too technical. Here the Quran says that Al-Ladina Yamshuna Al al What is the characteristic of Al al When you put the book like this, this highlights a very superficial, a very external, exterior, surface connection with what is under it. Whilst this water, it is fully engrossed, is fully covered by this cup. 
these individuals, these Abad al-Rahman, the way they are in this creation, the way they are in this dunya, it is not like the water who is drowning, who is fully encompassed by this glass, but rather they are like this book that it is placed on a table that has minimal surface contact, that it is not fully engrossed, it is not drowning. So this itself opens a whole another topic that the way that they interact with this world is on a very surface level. They are not individuals who are drowning in this world. But alal arudhahawna, they are very subtle. The contact they have with this world is very surface level. Now, what does that mean? And this was one of my confusions that what am I going to speak about these six nights? One of my topics was that looking at the dunya in the words of Amir al-Mu'minin in Nahj al because beautifully he explains the different dimensions of the dunya. But I've decided to take a summary of that and incorporate it onto this point. How is it that individuals are not drowned in this dunya? First of all, is dunya a good place? Is it a bad place? We always hear that Amir al-Mu'minin says, for example, that I have divorced you three times and I will not go back to you, right? Dunya is something which is very low. The meaning of dunya is low. Dani, donov, is low. One. Number two, something which is close. That is the meaning of dunya. So is dunya really low? Dunya is really that we should detest it, we shouldn't like it? Or should it like the dunya? We find that Nahj al paints a very perfect picture that maybe 30 nights will not even do justice to the way that how the sermons of Amir al-Mu'mineen discusses the dunya. But very briefly, there are two different views that the Imam paints when it comes to the dunya. Number one, it is a very reprimanding approach towards the dunya. For example, he says about the dunya, غُرُورٌ هَائِلٌ وَذَوْءٌ آفِل He says that this world, it is deceiving, a deceiving creation that quickly passes away. And it is also a light that very soon it will set. So very temporary. Something that you cannot count on. Today, you're here, tomorrow, we do not know how many of us are going to be here. If we are here right now in one hour, we do not know. Whether young or poor, this latest pandemic showed us that there is no faith to this dunya. That it will go and it will take anyone, regardless of their age, regardless of their gender, regardless of who they are. So you cannot really count on it. But then the Imam, he continues and he says, dunya. I warn you against the dunya. It is soft to touch, but it is deadly poisonous. It is green, it is sweet, but that can destroy you. It deceives you. The glitter of the world deceives the human being. The nature of the world that it drags you, it captivates you, it engulfs you, it imprisons you. In other places, he mentions, لا تدوم حبرتها ولا تؤمن فجعتها. The happiness that you have in this world doesn't last. You're happy for a few days, for a few hours, but then after that, you become sick. After that, you become ill. After that, someone passes away. After that, you go bankrupt. After that, a million and one things come in our head. And you cannot be saved and you cannot be safe from the dangers of this world. No, this dunya is very dangerous. Be wary of it. Be aware of it. So this is one painting. But then there is another painting as well of the dunya. Because there was an individual in Hikmah and wisdom number 131. The Imam says, There was an individual who was reprimanding the dunya. 
He was reprimanding the dunya. The imam, he replied. And he started praising the dunya. He says, This world is a place that you and I are able to collect provision. This place, this dunya is a blessing of God such that you and I are, atta- are able to attain perfection in this world. You and I are able to actualize our potentials in this world. And then he says, Masjid u Allah. Those who are in love with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this world is their masjid, is where they can do sujood. Wa musalli malaikatillah. The angels pray in this world. Wa mahbata wahiyallah is where divine revelation is revealed. This dunya is not a bad place. This dunya has so many blessings. This dunya has so many signs. This dunya is full of beauties of God. If a dunya which is ugly, a dunya which is divorced, how does that great lady say, everything is beauty? Because everything is a painting of God. Everything is a sign of God. Everything takes you towards that absolute. This world is a beautiful place. Now, we have these two different views. Two different approaches of Amir al-Mu'minin. How do you combine them? How do we reconcile? The answer is the following. The Imam replies, and he mentions in Nahj al-Balagha as well. The dunya is neither good nor bad. It is our relationship with the dunya which makes, makes it good or bad. It is not about what you possess in the world. It's not the case that if you have houses and if you have companies and if you have positions, now this person is someone who's drowning in the dunya, not necessarily. You can be a poor person with a notebook in your hand, but you're so attached to your notebook that for you, you are drowning in the dunya, but the millionaire is not drowning in the dunya. It is not what you possess. Is that... Are you owning your possessions or your possessions are owning you? Are your possessions helping you to grow? Are your possessions and your powers and your authorities and your positions enabling you to serve the creation of God? Or has it become an avenue of arrogance, an avenue of seeing myself better than others? An avenue of becoming an idol because I have X, Y, and Z. Which one? That is the criteria which Amir al muminin sets. That if you have everything, but you are utilizing what you have been given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to serve the creation of God. You recite on these nights, al khalqu kulluhum ayaluk. That the whole creation, they are the family members of God. (laughs) If you want to serve God, God doesn't need your service. God doesn't need my service. Serving God means serving the creation of God. We have in our traditions that on the day of judgment, God says, when I became sick, why did you not come and visit me? The individual asks and he says, God, you become sick? He says, that individual who became sick, why didn't you go and look after them? So the way to reconcile these two dimensions, these two approaches, is that to be able to moderate and gauge our relationship with the dunya. And Amir al muminin in sermon number 157, he mentions this clearly. He says, فَتَزَوَّدُوا فِي أَيَّامِ الْفَنَاءِ لَأَيَّامِ الْبَقَاءِ So in this world, what is our role? How do we approach it? Take provisions from it, from this temporary world, for that eternal world. <inaudible> you have been guided to collect provision. <inaudible> and you have been commanded as well to migrate. Sooner or later we will leave. <inaudible> but what is our role is to be able to be the best that we can in this creation. To be able to utilize every single gift that we have been given. 
You have been given wealth. You have been given health. You have been given a, an authority. You have been given a position. You have good children. You have fame. Whatever you have. You have knowledge. You have experience. In any way you can. When you're utilizing what you have been given in the way to serve the creation of God, that itself is an enabler for you and I to tread that path of being amongst the Abadur Rahman. And that is in fact how we see God in everything that we do. Remember, don't forget the main theme that now I am lecturing at university. I am mentoring someone. I am giving people, I am employing people. When I'm seeing it with this lens of utilization of everything for the greater good of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you find that your own business idea, your business initiative, your business dealing, your university lectures, your studies itself becomes a means and an avenue of growth. وَإِبَادُ الرَّحْمَانِ الَّذِينَ يَمْشُونَ عَلَى الْأَرْضِ حَوْنَا so this is the relationship that they have with the dunya, that they take what is needed for that eternal journey that they have in front of them. But how are they in this world? Hauna. They have a level of humility. Now, what is the meaning of haun? What is the meaning of arrogance? What does it mean to be, become arrogant? What are the signs of someone who is arrogant? What is the specific definition of someone who has arrogance? That inshallah you and I Tomorrow night, we can reflect and we'll talk about. And with the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we ask him by the rights of Muhammad and Ali Muhammad to make all of us amongst the Abadur Rahman. We ask him subhanahu wa ta'ala, those who have passed away, to bless them and to resurrect them with Muhammad and Ali Muhammad. We ask him subhanahu wa ta'ala, all those who are ill, those who are in need of our du'as, we ask him subhanahu wa ta'ala by the rights of Muhammad and Ali Muhammad to grant them a speedy recovery and above all of our hajad we ask him to hasten the reappearance of the 12th Imam inshallah wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Assalamu alayka ya Rasulullah Assalamu alayka ya Amir al-Mu'mineen Assalamu alayka ya Fatima al-Zahra Sayyidati Nisa al-Alameen Assalamu alayka ya Hassan al-Mujtaba Assalamu alayka ya Aba Abdullah al-Husayn Wa ala tis'at al-ma'sumin min dhurriyatik Ali ibn al-Husayn wa Muhammad ibn Ali Wa Ja'far ibn Muhammad wa Musa ibn Ja'far Wa Ali ibn Musa wa Muhammad ibn Ali Wa Ali ibn Muhammad wa Al-Hassan ibn Ali Wa Al-Hujjat ibn Al-Hassan Ajal Allahu farajah wa sakhlahu ta'ala makhrajah Wa Dhuhur al-Amri wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Allahumma kulli waliyika Hujjat ibn Al-Hassan Salawatuka alayhi وَأَلَا بَاحِي فِي هَذِي السَّاتِ وَفِي كُلِّ سَاتِ وَلِيَّا وَحَافِذَا وَكَائِدَا وَنَاسِرَا وَدَلِيلَا وَعَيْنَا حَتَّى تُسْكِنَعُوا وَرْدَكَا تَوْعَا وَتَمَتِّعُوا فِيهَا تَوِيلَا بِرَحْمَتِكِ يَا رَحْمَ الرَّحِمِينَ Again, brothers, can I please request you all to be seated? Tea is being served. Please be seated, a son. <laughs>